The scripture reading today is Hebrews 11, verse 24 through 25. Moses showed this same faith all through his youth. He refused to become emotionally attached to Pharaoh or even to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to suffer persecution with God's people rather than to stay at the palace and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a few short years. Well, there was mistake number one. Sorry, Olivia. It was actually supposed to be chapter 10. No wonder that didn't make any sense to anybody. My fault. Sorry. The scripture actually is Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And it says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting or encouraging one another, and so much more, even as you see the day approaching. Sorry, Olivia, you did awesome, though. Uh, my son informed me that this is not an appropriate picture for church. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple quick things I want to talk about before I start my um, sermon today. You have about 50,000 inserts in your bulletin, which is awesome. That means there's lots going on. One of them I want to draw your attention to is about women's retreat. I'm a member of the Women's Ministry Committee for our conference, and so I just want to give you a little heads up of what's going on next weekend. There may not be quite as many women in church, I hope, because I'm really hoping that you'll all be in my backyard. Um, if the weather is decent, you are invited to my backyard. Um, at, Sabbath school is going to start at 930. But listen, the day really, there's an entire day worth of information, women's retreat, conference, seminars, our main speaker, Elizabeth Talbot. It's all going to be virtual and online, but you're invited to come to my backyard. We're going to have a setup. We're going to do lunch at my house. Um, I invite any, any women, bring your friends, anybody can come. If you want to wear a mask, that's fine. I have no problem with that. Um, we are going to try to do it outside to keep our distance just because um, some of you are a little more cautious than I am, and I apologize that I am not. I will try to not hug you if you don't want to be hugged. Um, as I said, it will be a full day on Sabbath. You can come stay as long as you want. Please RSVP to me. My phone number is on that flyer by Thursday, just so I know um, what we're going to do for food that day. So floating, floating face down <clears throat> with my inappropriate picture. This week has been a little bit interesting. Those of you that might follow me on Facebook saw my, my hideous morning face. Um, Wednesday night, it was cold this week. Did you guys notice? <laughs> Jack's like, yes, no, I, I'm okay with that. But it was cold and rainy. And by the time I got home from work on Wednesday, I was tired. Audrey was exhausted. Um, school wipes her out. She hid. Seven o'clock, man, she was ready to go. So I went in and laid down with her on her bed. About 7.30, Jackson comes in. Tap, 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 tap. Mom, you're asleep. Do you want to be? Uh, fine. So I peel myself out of Audrey's bed. By about eight o'clock, I'm like, forget this, man. So I go lay down in my bed. Well, I laid there for like, I don't know, what was it, an hour, Josh? And I can't go to sleep. I was exhausted. I was freezing. All I wanted to do was go to sleep in my nice, warm, comfy bed. Can't go to sleep. Fine. I have this sermon on my mind. It's Wednesday. Okay, fine. So I get up and I go sit at my desk. I sat there and I had all these, well, because as I'm laying in bed and I can't sleep, these ideas are all going through my head, all these great things to say, all these points that would be fabulous to make, all these stories, all these witty little things to say. So I get up, I go to my computer. I sat there for like an hour. I had great stuff out. Okay, I'm starting to get a little tired. It's about 11 o'clock. Shut the computer, go back to bed. Wake up Thursday. It was an awful day. The kids immediately, you guys, your kids wake up like angels, right? Oh, mine are, yeah, they get to school and I, I don't know, where's Carrie? Were they any better at school? <laughs> I get home. Oh, I was supposed to meet one of my friends. It was supposed to be like an all morning get together thing. We had like 45 minutes for lunch and that was it. I was really disappointed. I get home, yelled at my husband and my kids because, you know, I'm the only one doing anything in my entire house. That doesn't happen in your house, is it? My husband loves it when I tell stories about home. Yeah, it was a great day. So after I finally get done with all of that, get them to help me clean up the house, I go to open my computer. Gone. Don't know. Poof. 
into cyberspace. I got nothing. So between lovely Thursday and then opening my computer and everything gone, you know, I've really um, come to the conclusion that Satan is alive and well, you guys, and he really doesn't have any problem at all with jumping on my back and beating me with a stick. And especially if you're going to get up and do something like preach, you better expect it. So it has been a little bit interesting. Let me tell you what. Um, I'm pretty sure that really he doesn't want me to talk at all or about what I'm going to talk about. I don't know which one. And the other side of it that's a good side of that is I've kind of learned that um, when things like this happen, it's a great reminder to me of this little discussion that God and I had of when I stand up, I talk, I mean, I open my mouth and he talks. And if something like this has happened, all my notes are gone, then I really don't have any doubt in my mind that when I stand up and talk, it really doesn't have anything to do with me at all. I'm a mouthpiece is my goal. And I'm really hoping that even though Satan really wasn't interested in me talking at all today, that you get something out of what I have to say. Um, there will be a disclaimer in the middle of this sermon, so just make sure you listen for that. Um, bow your heads with me before I start. All right, God, you know the drill. We already had this discussion that when I stand up to talk, really, I just open my mouth and you're the one that's supposed to say this the words because I can't do it right. And I ask that you open people's ears and that you make this a subject that people are willing and open to hear. Thank you for the Sabbath and our time to get together. I pray and the ability to come freely and worship together. Amen. So my sermon is floating face down. So I haven't, according to some of you, been alive very long, but according to my children, I'm quite old. So over the years of my life, I've watched a certain culture shift. I grew up in the 80s in what I considered a very traditional Seventh-day Adventist home. Uh, we went to church every Sabbath, unless you were sick. That was just what you did. Even when we went on vacation, if there was a Seventh-day Adventist church in the vicinity, we went to church. And um, Carter, we went to Sabbath school in a church we didn't know. Who ever thought that was a good idea? I mean, they make you stand up front and then they sing songs to you. How many of you wanted to do that as a kid? My son would have curled up in the floor and died. Nobody wanted to do that anyway. Sorry, I'm digressing again. But anyway, we went to church every Sabbath. It didn't matter. Into my college years, yes, I went to a Seventh-day Adventist university, but I was free. I lived in an apartment. I could do whatever I wanted. Um, those were a bit more rough years. That's another story. But I still had a self-imposed, I go to church every Sabbath. That's just what I did. But as I got older, as the years pass, um, I started to notice that perhaps maybe I was not the norm, that it was not a normal thing for people to go to church every Sabbath, and that it was not a normal thing to go, not just go to church, but every Sabbath. It was not a normal thing. I want you to think back with me in your imagination. You know, 50, 80, 100 years ago, who went to church? 50, 80 years ago. Come on, you guys, you have to talk back to me. I'm sorry, you gotta, you gotta talk back. Who went to church 50 to 80, 100 years ago? Everybody, everybody who did. That was what you did for your social group. That was what you did for your entertainment. That was what you did for your spiritual food. I mean, our entire country, the United States of America was based on religious freedom of being able to go to church. The Seventh-day Adventist church, one of our foundational stones is it's the seventh day of the week, Sabbath worship. But as we go through the years um, and we arrive at this insane year of 2020 that we're in now, regular church attendance has had some major issues, if you haven't noticed. So even before we hit March and Easter and coronavirus, if you were to look at any Google search of church attendance graphs, you would find something like this. Now, I'm not so concerned that you can actually read the graph. The next one is even worse. But where's the general trend? Down. Same thing here. Decline of church attendance. Where's it go? Down. This is all before Corona, by the way. If you haven't noticed, Corona really, really badly wiped out churches. And if you look around your church right now, what do we have? What do you see? Every other row. So even if we could fill every row, we can't. Our attendance is down. The churches that have opened, attendance is down. And while this is a really good thing, I mean, it's 
it saved a lot of our immunocompromised people. I'm not saying that you shouldn't stay home if you're sick. Please do not misconstrue that. But what I'm saying is that Satan has had a heyday with church attendance and the coronavirus. He was having a heyday before we ever hit this, and this was like brick wall, run into the wall. Um, before coronavirus, I'm sure that every one of us could think of reasons, a whole huge list of not going to church, reasons why you don't go to church. Somebody give me a good reason of why you wouldn't go to church. Come on now. I'm too tired. I worked all week. I worked late last night. Maybe I worked the overnight shift. Okay, what else? I do not want to get dressed. I am in my pajamas and man, I want to stay in them. What else? I do not get anything out of church. Why would I bother going to all of that effort? What else? I do not want to drag my kids. What was the other one? We don't have a pastor, so there's not even going to be anybody up front decent to preach like this week. You guys crack me up, by the way. I, I walk in and you're all like, oh, we're so excited to hear you preach. I told Randy, I was like, maybe you better wait until after you hear the sermon before you say anything like that. You might not want to. So all of these things, there is a set of drums on the stage, you guys. I am not going. Or maybe, oh, there is no music at all. I am not going any huge list of reasons of why I do not want to go to church. And um, then the pandemic happened. And what did we get to do? We get to stay home in our pajamas. Do I have to brush my teeth? Absolutely not. I did get called out. Who was it? Somebody when we were doing Zoom church. Oh, it was Lee. It was your husband. He saw me drinking my coffee during church and condemned me for it. So you had to be careful of what you were doing in front of the computer. But what else? I mean, you didn't have to get dressed. If you didn't like the music that was going on your Zoom church service, what did you do? Mute. Go to a different one. How many options were there out there for Zoom or pre-recorded church services? A gazillion. If you didn't like it, go find a different one. So now we come to here we are in, what is this, September? Why would you bother coming back to church? Do we even really need a church building anymore? Why do we need all these small churches? I mean, why don't we all just stay home in our pajamas or your underwear if you want, if that's what you do? With your, <laughs> sorry, that was, <laughs> my husband's like, no, don't say things like that. Drink your coffee, not brush your teeth, watch whatever you want. Why do we need small churches? Why do we even bother? Why don't we all just stay home and watch the biggest church services with the best music and the best preachers. Why do we need this? So this has been on my mind for a long time, even before this year. And I wondered, why is it on my mind? Why is this pulling on my heartstrings? Um, is it just because it's tradition and I've done it my whole life? I mean, you guys know we do things because it's traditional, right? That's how you were raised. That's what's normal. You go to church. Some people do it for guilt. If I don't go to church, it's guilt. Um, there's all kinds of different reasons, but why, why is it important now? And is it important? You know, some people are really um, looking at churches and the way church services run now and think, hmm, it's time to completely adjust our church. And I'm not talking just Seventh-day Adventist churches. I'm talking all churches. Because of the shifts that we've had in our culture, in our world, in our health, there is a huge question mark. What do we want for church? So I started looking into this because I think this is important. And maybe I'm the odd duck out. Um, I often think in my generation, I was probably born in the wrong generation because I am often the odd duck out in my generation. Um, really though, that question, I can pick this up I can whisper sweet nothings into my Google search and get any service that I want. So why would I bother coming here? Somebody tell me what the first commandment is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and you shall have no other gods before me. All of those things go together. I'm not quoting the Bible directly. I'm sorry, I'm not great at that. I'm not a pastor by the way. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. 
how we spend our time is the truest measure of God's place in our lives. If we are quick to fill the time set aside for worshiping God with visiting family, going to the beach, attending concerts, or just relaxing, what we are unintentionally saying is that those things matter more than God. That one kind of hurts. That one kind of hurts. If we're showing the people around us, if we're showing our children this, we're saying that God's really not number one. Now, here's a couple quotes and then I'm gonna to come to my disclaimer. Church attendance is as vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood to a sick man. That's from early American evangelist Dwight L. Moody from the 1800s. So let's go back a little bit more. Who else thinks that it's important? To gather with God's people in united adoration of our Father is as necessary to the Christian life as prayer. Martin Luther, that goes back to the 1500s. So my disclaimer, I'm not standing up here to condemn any single stinking one of you with what you do on Sabbath. Please do not take this as that. It is none of my business and my opinion really does not matter what you do on your Sabbath day. Our house, Josh and I don't really think it's bad to every now and then take a Sabbath off, don't go to church, do something with our kids in nature. We also love to travel. Um, we are gone a lot. We go to churches other places because of that. No, we try not to drag our kids into Sabbath schools that torture them because that would be torture for us too. But what I have learned though, and what the current trends in our culture are telling us is that if we don't make regular habits to attend our home church, our church will die an empty death. Let me say that again, because that's really, really important. If you, if I do not make it a regular habit to attend my home church, then this church will die an empty death. Now, um, quick side note, if you don't know me, you might not, um, or maybe if you do know me, you'll think I'm not a member here, so why would I say that? We are transferring our membership to here, so I will be soon a member of this church, but I'm talking your church, your home church, and this will be my home church. If I don't make it a point to regularly attend my home church, what's gonna to happen to my church? So our digital age with all of its amazing benefits and information out there, it cannot make up for spiritual in-person interactions with fellow believers and that is leaving all of us and our churches floating face down. Did you get that? Should I repeat it? Even with everything we have digitally, even with every Zoom church on the planet, it cannot and will not make up for a spiritual in-person interaction with fellow believers. And what does that cause? Death. Pretty nasty word. I get it. So what are some reasons of why you should stay in church other than you don't want to float face down? First one we're going to talk about is early church examples. And the early church was very, very, it, it was the most important thing to them to follow Jesus' example. They didn't have other churches, other religions, other things to follow. They were specific in following Jesus' example. So if you look in Luke chapter four, and this one is correct. Sorry, Olivia, again. Four verse 16 talks about Jesus coming into Nazareth where he had been brought up. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Where did he go? Church on the Sabbath day. And what does it say about that? Did he just go sometimes? Is that what it says? As was his custom. Sounds like he went every week to me. Lots of stories in the Bible talk about, if you read back, Jesus taught everywhere. 
and he did not need a church to speak to people, but he did go to church regularly. Um, this was part of our scripture verse today. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as in some, as, as some people do don't forsake it, but get together exhorting or strongly encouraging one another. And I want to, I highlighted this. I don't know if you can tell at the bottom, my paraphrase of that sentence, because that might be wording a little bit, a little bit crazy, but as the end of time gets closer, we're supposed to be doing this more. It's even more important now. I mean, what is everybody talking about? Even people out in the world, people I didn't know were Christians. I had a, one of the doctors at work talk to me about, hasn't anybody read Revelation? And I stared at her. Well, no, no, most people don't read Revelation. So I didn't know you did. End of time stuff. We talk about it a lot lately. Apostolic churches. So those churches back in the time of the apostles, those early churches. If you read through the chapter Acts 2, it talks about a time of very vital church growth. So really strong church growth. It even goes so far as to talk about the members of those churches. It talks about them almost living together. They pooled everything, all their resources together. It doesn't mention at all people's spiritual needs being met in solitude or simply being spiritually fed alone. It talks about them being together. It talks about ministry and fellowship. And now living together, I think that might seem a little bit cultish to all of us and people looking at us now. But the main point still remains, regular church fellowship was a staple in those early church times. So here's number two. When you come to church, you immerse yourself in fellowship, in worship, and in scripture. Now, people will perhaps argue with me on this, but I think that the main job of the church is to teach the scriptures. What do you think? Fairly basic? Main job of church, to teach the scriptures. If you look at the entire book, not just a chapter, the entire book of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, they all teach about where a church should focus. And then it also goes into the importance of the body of Christ there. From 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's good for doctrine, that's teaching, reproof or rebuking for correction and for the instruction of righteousness, that every, that the man of God or every man of God may be complete and equipped, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So Miss Ewers sometimes sends homework home with my boys. Um, Jessica and I had a discussion about this this week. Sometimes homework comes home and we sit and look at it. And normally there's tears involved and shrieking and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And I will sit down and I will attempt to explain in six different ways how to do this particular problem. I mean, I'm thinking outside the box. I'm doing my very best to explain this. Okay, he didn't get it that way. Let's try a different way. Well, I would say eight times out of 10, they stare at me like I'm an alien and they have no idea what I'm talking about. They're really good at that. Now, I would venture to guess that if Jessica came over and sat down with one of my boys and went over that particular problem and explained it in her way with her sweet face, that they would look at her like a light bulb popped on in their head and they would get it and they would move along and learn. The point is, sometimes in order to get the point of scripture, you need someone else to explain it. Your personal worship time is amazing. You should do it. I encourage it every day. Spend time with Jesus. You need that. But there is something about someone else speaking about scripture or explaining it to you that all of a sudden it's like, poof, I never thought about it that way. I never got it before. If you don't spend time in Christian fellowship, you will completely miss that. You will not get those insightful moments from someone else if you do not have Christian fellowship. The second part of this one is, I mentioned before, and there's been 7 million sermons preached on the topic of Christ comparing his church to a body. Fingers, toes, eyeballs, heads, hairs, whatever. Every person in the church is supposed to be a piece of the body of Christ, right? So we know if we don't have feet, we don't walk very well, right? We don't have toes. We don't pick up things off the floor. If we don't have fingers, we don't pick up things off of here. But did you ever think about how you treat the fingers of Christ? 
Do you talk to the other members of God's church who happen to represent the fingers of Christ like you're slamming them in the door? How do you treat the people around you who are members of the body of Christ? This picture cracked me up, by the way. You have to be careful how you treat the other members of the body of Christ. Okay. Next one, number three. Your personal growth of character is taught to you by your interactions with your brothers and sisters of faith. So I want all of you to stop. And I know you're not supposed to stare at people. It's rude. I'm sorry. Turn around and look at people. I don't want you to make eye contact. Just turn around and look at the people around you. All over. Look at the people around you. Yes, Josh, you too. Look at somebody besides me. I know you love it. Valley's looking at you right now. <laughs> look around you and look at these people. Now, think carefully. What have you learned from these people around you? What have you learned from the people around you? That one person that maybe you have the biggest beef with? Or maybe that one person that drives you stark raving mad? What have you learned from that person? Did it ever cross your mind that perhaps God put that person in your life to teach you to develop a character of grace? You ever think of it like that? Maybe he put that person in your line of vision because you need to learn a lesson of patience. Let's not talk about that one. That one's a little painful. If you choose to not have fellowship or interact with the people in your church, how can God develop your character using that person? You're completely going to miss that lesson on grace. If you choose to not interact with those people, how can God develop your character? That was a little heavy. So number four is your daily double. I really wanted to do that thing, you know, in Jeopardy where it spins around and does a do, 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 daily double. So here's your daily double. There is a surprise blessing in ministering to each other. So last week, Taryn preached, I think it was last week that Taryn preached, wasn't it? Taryn preached about God's math and how his math is not like our math. It's very true. I really, that was like a, a buzzer for me because it is true. God's math is not like our math. Here's an example of that. Um, you guys know I go to camp during the summer. The first year that I went, I am the staff mentor at our Adventist summer camp in Missouri, by the way, if you don't know. And I get to go and mentor to the staff. I'm not there for the campers. I'm there to the staff, kind of like a staff pastor, if you will. And so my first summer going in, I'm obviously terrified because I get there and I have no idea how am I going to relate to these people. They're going to think I'm just old. What am I going to do? And so there was a lot of prayer going on. And that was when God and I made that agreement that I'm going to open my mouth and you're going to talk because I don't know what to say. But I got there. I'm thinking about, I mean, my main focus is what can I do to help these people grow? How can I help them be spiritually enriched? What can I do for these people? Um, I get to the end of the summer and surprise, surprise, I don't, they say I was a blessing to them. I don't know. They can, they can discuss, discuss that later. But what I got, what I came out with was this ginormous fire this blessing that God poured out on me. I wasn't focusing on me. I was not going to look for a blessing for me. That was not my goal. My goal was going to feed and bless these young people. And what I came out with was this huge blessing on myself. Because when you minister to someone else, the surprise blessing, you get blessed too. Now, you have to go in with the goal of ministering to someone else. <laughs> then you get the surprise blessing. If you miss the ministering to someone else, you miss that daily double, that blessing. So how do we save our churches? How do we save this church, your church, from that perpetuality of floating face down like that, as Jackson says, inappropriate first picture? How do we save ourselves from that? So there's probably about a gazillion sermons and topics and theories on this too. But here's what I think. If we want our church, this church, your church, my church, if we want it to grow and to thrive, we must start by ministering to one another. 
start by ministering to one another. You're not going to start by looking at how you're going to grow your church and how you're going to do evangelism and how you're going to go to the community. I don't believe that's where you're supposed to start. Because if we don't care about each other, who in the world is going to want to come join this church? Is that what you want to be a part of? I don't. I don't want to go in a church and sit down and be like, oh, these people obviously don't care at all. I am not interested in joining that one. I told you, you might not like it after I get done preaching. It hurts sometimes because it points out our weaknesses. But if we can't get past the end of our own noses and look at the people that's sitting in the pew around us, I'm sorry, but you're going to float face down. And I'm sorry, but your church is going to float face down. We will not grow and we will not thrive if we don't care about the people sitting next to us. So how you plan on ministering to somebody next to you? Be creative, you guys. I know we're old. We don't know how to be creative anymore. We tried all that. It didn't work. I know. I get it. But bear with me. Check on somebody who didn't come to church this week. If you're coming to church on a regular basis, you're going to know who didn't come this week, but who's been here every other week, right? Now, for me, I'm just starting to come back regularly, so I don't know all of you. But if you are regularly coming to church, you're going to spot who's not there. Hey, you weren't at church this week. Are you okay? Do you need anything? Just want to check and make sure you're doing all right. So yeah, obviously visiting people has changed a lot in our current culture. There's nothing wrong with calling somebody who's not coming to church and be like, listen, I know that you're worried about Corona, but I just want to make sure you were okay. Would you like a visit? I'd be happy to wear a mask. I'd be happy to sit on your front step and talk to you. Or if you're not comfortable with that, hey, can we just have a conversation on the phone? Because I miss you. I just want to make sure you're okay. Be creative. This is not rocket science at all. So why don't we change our church atmosphere? Why do we have to stay the same? We don't need to. We don't need to stay the same. So let's change our entire church atmosphere. Here's an idea. Why don't we start a Sabbath lunch group? Just an idea. I'm not saying we have to, but I'm just giving you some ideas. So say every week, we have a schedule every week. This week's my week. I make enough food for two families. If there are any visitors, I'm gonna invite you to my house for church. It's my week. If there aren't any visitors, who wants to come to my house this week? Next week, it's Carrie's week. She's made double food. Any visitors in church, they're going to her house for lunch. Just an idea, you guys. But why do we have to do it the same way we've always done it? So here's my goal. I want to start a family group. This is my new, my new little advertisement here. Families raising salty kids. Maybe we're going to be salt seekers. You're the salt of the earth. The only purpose of this group, you guys, is to get together for fellowship and to show our kids what it's like to be salty, be different. Show my kids what it's like to get together and have fellowship with other families and that we're working together to raise our kids to look different, to act different. I can do this. This is easy. Just a once a month thing. Hey, maybe this, this month. Hey, Tara said we can all come to her house this week. So anybody who wants to with families, you know, with kids, I'm not trying to exclude you that don't have kids. That's not my point. If you don't have kids, step up to the plate. Maybe we're going to have a seniors club and we're going to get together. Think outside the box is what I'm asking you to do. Let's not be stuck in a rut. We've been there. We're doing that. It's not working real well, is it? So let's stop. Caring for the people about you and ministering to those around you will cause growth. So when you were a kid, did you ever wish you could be part of somebody else's family? Why did you want to be part of somebody else's family? Talk to me. Carter's laughing. Did he want to be part of somebody else's family? Whose family did you want to be part of, Carter? <laughs> Dad says who wants him. No, but why did you want to be part of somebody else's family? They had more fun. Maybe they actually liked each other. Maybe the mom looked out and said, I want to be part of that family. Their kids actually get along. I want to trade. You wanted to be part of a group that cared about each other, that was fun, 
that ministered to each other. If you want this church to grow, then you have to start caring about each other because your church will not grow. Our church will not grow if we don't care about each other. If we are unwilling to minister to those around us, that's when church growth starts to happen. So let's recap here quick. Number one reason you need to go to church every week, because you cannot lose if you're following the example of Christ. He went to church, Bible says so. You're enriching yourself and others around you by your immersion in scripture and your continued fellowship with like-minded believers. You wanna learn more about scripture, go to church. You wanna hear a different version of scripture, go to church. You will start to see growth in your own character as you allow God to work in your interactions with those around you. You wanna grow in your character? You wanna become a better person? In general, a better person or a more Christ-like person? Start interacting with your fellow believers. You will receive a double blessing as you start to minister to the needs of your fellow man around you. And then you're going to start to see growth in your church. The main goal of every church, I think, on this planet is to grow. As others see the personal ministry taking place within your church family, they're going to want to be a part of that. So here's my challenge for you. I like to give you a challenge when I stand up here. And if anybody gets up to preach and says they're not halfway preaching to themselves, they're probably not telling you the truth. So this is my challenge for me too. And I think my husband's probably kind of tired of hearing about this, so I have to tell you guys about it. Here's my challenge for you. Here's my challenge for me. I want you to sit down with your spouse or by yourself, and I want you to make a commitment. I want you to commit to a certain stretch of time. My advice, 12 weeks, three months. And I want you to make a commitment that I will be in my home church pew the majority of those 12 weeks. And I will come to Sabbath school. Let's get it up and going. Let's go. Make a commitment in your home. Because habits take time. It's going to take you a while to get into the habit. But I'm going to go out on a limb here. And I'm going to say in 12 weeks, if you don't notice a difference and you don't see any of these things starting to happen, call me. We'll chat. In 12 weeks, you're going to start to see these things happen to you. I want you to find out what your spiritual gift is. And I want you to get involved. So I like to talk. I'm going to invite people to my house to talk. I can do that. Maybe you're like my husband and you don't want to talk. So he likes to mow the grass. It's going to start growing next week, I think, if it warms back up. He can mow the grass. What can you do? What are you doing? Figure out what you can do and do it. Get involved. And then you let me know if you don't start getting some blessings back. Because I all but guarantee you that they will. Let our focus start with ministering to each other. Because if you don't care about the people around you, you will not grow. By the way, did you forget that we have a commission? Can you read that? It's not very easy to read. What's our commission? We're going there, but what are we supposed to do to get there? What is our commission from the Bible? What does the Bible say our commission is? What is our job, you guys? We're supposed to spread the light. We are supposed to be spreading the light. Let your light so shine before men that they're going to see your good deeds. Not because of you. They're going to see your deeds and then glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light shine. Start to believe you don't have what it 
brown heaven to us but make no mistake there's still more to come without the flesh and our bone are no longer between but we are right now and where we're meant to be where an that's been lost was made whole Father in heaven, we're almost home and I just want to come home. I'm tired of the burdens and I'm tired of the trials and I'm tired of the mess. But it's not time yet. You haven't called us back. So while we're here, we're supposed to be your light. I really ask that you light that light inside of each one of us because it's hard. It's hard and we're struggling with our own characters and our own flaws and all the things that we fight. And I just ask that you light that fire inside of us to remind us that we are almost home and it's not time to quit now. Bring us back to this house. Bring us back to your house. Over and over and over again. Bless us this week, I pray. Amen.